And so in this case, let me see, what do I have here? RLC. Okay, let's let's go ahead and start with the workbook. And we were probably about right there. A little after that. Sorry, almost there. Okay. So I want to talk about this problem right here. We looked at this last time and did some simulations. Um, I I don't think we did all of this last time. I think I just showed you a simulation of it. So now let's actually go through and look at this crap and do it. So I'm going to start drawing it up and then we'll go through this thing. Here we go, 31.1. Okay, LC oscillator one. We've got a resistor here. We've got a weird switch that can go from position A to position B. There's a capacitor in the central branch, an inductor. Oh, wait, no, there's no inductor there. A resistor here. Inductor over there. We are told R equals 12.0 ohms. So that's a small resistance. C equals 20.0 microfarads. L equals 10.0 millihenries. And E is 24.0 volts. All right. It's an A for a long time, got it. Oh, and I better get my questions out here. Sorry. Geez, there's a lot of junk here. Okay. Okay, so here's the situation. We're gonna put this thing in position A for a long time, the capacitor will charge up. Then we're gonna switch it over to B, and what should happen? There's energy stored here, there's no resistance in this loop, that energy is going to change forms from potential energy here stored in the capacitor to kinetic energy in the inductor. What do I mean by that? You could think of charge as position and the derivative of charge as current, right? So. Uh, and you could think of the energy here in here, the energy inside an inductor is one half L I squared. L is like mass, I is like velocity. So this is like kinetic energy. Over here in this one, I know that the energy in a capacitor is Q squared over two C. So it turns out Q is like position and one over C is like a spring constant. So this ends up looking like one half K X squared if K is the same thing as one over C. So you could think of this as being like spring potential energy and current as being kinetic energy. If that helps, the idea here is you charge up this one, that's like compressing the spring, then you let go of it and it's gonna oscillate back and forth. And so the energy is gonna go from all potential to all kinetic to all potential or in the terms of electric fields and magnetic fields, first there's all electrical energy stored in the fields between the capacitor plates. Then it changes over to all magnetic energy stored in the magnetic fields of the energized solenoid or condu uh, inductor. All right, so if we leave this in A for a long period of time, help me out. If you leave this in A for a long time, what happens to the capacitor? We're gonna put this in A, oh, go ahead. It gets fully charged. Fully charged, so what is that full charge? Um, v times C. EC. Or, yes. Yes, it's EC. All right, now we've got that done. We disconnect it. Part B says, determine the oscillation frequency. Now, if it helps, I just wanna show you here, 
all the facts that you need for dealing with LC oscillators. I've kind of given you the, the theory behind it or the concept behind it. It's basically changing forms back and forth, but all the equations you need are on the previous page here. So if you're wondering where I'm getting the equations from, it's on the previous page. And so I look and it says oscillation frequency. Well, right there at the top, let's do it this way. This is the oscillation angular frequency. So what you're going to find in this chapter, people use the terms frequency and angular frequency interchangeably, even though they have different units and it's going to drive you crazy. That said, I will, I will try to be you know, straight with you. So here, what we know is omega naught is equal to one over the square root of LC. In this problem, I know both L and C, I've got it. If I wanna convert this to a linear frequency, any of my old frequency tricks from physics one will work. In particular, maybe you know this. Uh, this is what I remember. I remember omega naught equals two pi F equals two pi over the period. And so you could imagine if I put a question like this on your final exam or the next quiz, you could imagine uh, I will try to use angular frequency for omega or talk about radians per second for the units. That's a giveaway that I'm talking about omega. If I say radian, F naught has units of Hertz or one per second and then period. So the idea is you could talk about any of these things and they're basically all related. So you're supposed to know that if I tell you the period, you know this, or if I tell you the frequency, you know the period, back and forth, back and forth. And we'll work on that in lab tomorrow too. I have a quick question. Yes. So in this case, are you asking for angular frequency? Or As the stated, linear? it looks like it's linear frequency. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I'm just, I'm just warning you that if you take electrical engineering courses, everybody's going to say frequency and probably mean omega. That's just the way it is. Yeah. So um, people get lazy and they just say frequency all the time when they mean omega. I don't know. At least that was my experience. Maybe, you know, you'll have a different one. Um, good, Jay? Is that a yes, thank you. At and to be honest, on a final exam... I suppose I'd probably be a little bit lenient as long as you write the correct units, right? So remember that this one has units of radians per second. This one has units of Hertz, HZ. Go ahead, Tom. What were you saying? Was that N part one of, or two pi over tau, that T? Oh, that's a T. That's a, I, this is a double strike T. So it's just a letter T, but then so it doesn't look like tension or something else, I just make it a double and I give it these. I don't know why, that's just my way of writing period so that it doesn't look like the normal T. Okay, so that's the period. This I, is just the period. Good. So if you see me write that double T, that's my way of keeping it straight from some other T. Good. That one's not too bad. It's basically use your equation sheet, plug it in. All right. So a good tip would be remember page 195 if you get a quiz question on this, right? Because you've got all the stuff written there. It's just, if you haven't done these two problems on this page, you'll be too slow to do anything about it, but yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, let's see what the next question was. I've forgotten already. Okay, so now it says determine the amplitude of current oscillations. This is the main fundamental physics that we need to talk about here, okay? I wanna figure out the current amplitude. So what's happening here? Maybe I could show you with the simulation. Oops, not that one. Not that one, this one. Let's take this resistance and jack it all the way down. I'm gonna take this down, gonna reset it. 
all right? And so right now, what we've got is the inductor is energized. So it's a little bit different than the picture I showed you. What's gonna happen now is I'm gonna lift this switch and I want you to watch what happens right here. So this is a very small resistor. R is not zero, but it's approximately equal to zero, okay? So in this case, I want you to watch, this is the inductor and this is the capacitor. So it's pretty similar. And notice down here, we can get the voltages on them, right? So when I run this thing, let's do this. So let me get rid of that. Whoops. I'm gonna flip the switch and notice what happens. We see the energy basically going back and forth between the inductor and the capacitor. And if I could do this, right at the instant when the capacitor hits max charge, how much current flows through the inductor? At the instant the capacitor is fully charged, how much current flows through the capacitor, or sorry, flows through the inductor? Zero. Exactly. And how about the instant when, the, when there's maximum current? Right when you have maximum current, how much charge is on the capacitor plates? Zero. None. Aha! So wait a minute. What we see is, if I want to know the largest possible charge, I study the capacitor when there's no current flow. If I want to find out the maximum possible current, I study the inductor when there's no charge on the capacitor, right? Said another way, if I want to, I know the initial energy is all in the capacitor. And then at the point when this has max current, this has no energy, it's all changed over. That means this. So ah, where's that marker? In part C, this is what's cool about it. The energy on the capacitor maximum should equal the maximum energy on the inductor. And from there, we could say, well, doesn't that mean Q maximum over uh, squared over 2C should equal uh, one half L I maximum squared. Again, all I did was I said, I took the, this energy is Q squared over 2C. I said this energy, when it's as large as possible, there was no inductor energy. And then this energy, when it's as large as possible, there's no capacitor. So the idea is, we know that this one's gonna max out at say 20 joules. And then at some point later, this will be all 20 joules. And then it's gonna come back to this one, it'll be 20 joules. And it will just keep going back and forth, trading the 20 joules. So at this point, we see an interesting relationship. I see that Q max relates to I max through L and C. At the rest of it, it's just algebra. And that algebra is actually already done for you on page 195 and I, I worked it all out. But that's the main concept you need to figure out here is that the energy is changing from one side to the other. So the trick in these problems is to set the energy of one equal to the energy of the other. And that at least helps you relate the maxes to each other. Uh, questions on that? Sneaky. So in this case, we're finding, we're solving for I max mm -hmm. when we know what Q max is. Correct. We figured out Q max because that's easy. And then we know L and C, we're done. Yeah. All right, good. All right, so next, I don't know if you noticed, but those voltages, if I could show that again, when you have an oscillator, I don't know if you could see this, but these look like sine waves here, right? Or you could call them cosine waves, depending on when you start and stop this. So, right, the idea is this, depending on when I start and stop this right now, this looks like a cosine wave. If I start at a half second later, whoops, oh. Oh, I don't know how to do that, right? Right there, oh gosh, I'm having trouble with this clicking. But the idea is you could start and stop the time at different spots and you'd either get a sine wave or a cosine wave. Well, how does that manifest itself in an equation? Let me see if I could show you. If I go back to the previous page, 
the idea is in general, these equations help us explain the current as a function of time or the charge as a function of time. It's either gonna be a sine or a cosine and this phase angle, do not get tripped out by this. The phase angle, basically, uh, look what happens when you plug in t equals zero. If you plug in t equals zero, this goes away and this goes away and you get these equations. Essentially, the phase angle is the number that helps us ensure that our equations match up to the correct initial and final. So for example, in this one, look what happens if I plug in zero degrees here. What's cosine of zero degrees? One. And so notice Q initial would be Q max. And notice in this case, I initial would be zero because sine of zero. So the phase angle basically is a fancy way of helping us write these things down. If you don't like thinking about phase angles, you better not be an electrical engineer. But there's, a, if you don't have to do this, here's a quick shortcut that I use so you don't have to think about the phase angles as much. You could either write Q is sine omega t or cosine, and then the plus minus sign is determined by the polarity you choose, okay? And then if the capacitor is initially uncharged, you use sine omega t. If it's initially fully charged, you use cosine omega t. And then the voltage oscillations, okay, that's fine. Same thing for the current, right? And again, the, the polarity is not that important to me, uh, but I will show you how to do it in just a minute. But again, if the capacitor is an, oh shoot, this word right here should be inductor. Um, yeah, that should be inductor. All right. So, and I guess this should be energized, uh, not energized. So to be clear here, uh, actually, you know what would work easier? Just scratch out the un <laughs> there. And then make this un. And then it's basically exactly flip-flop from the other one, right? If the capacitor is initially charged, we use sine omega t for this one because the current starts out at zero. And if the capacitor is initially uncharged, that means the inductor must have all the energy at first. So go ahead and fix that up there. This is page 195. I'm going to write that down. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so let's go back to the next page and try and work through this. So if we try to get an expression for current as a function of time, okay, let's see if any of that previous crap made any sense. Okay, the capacitor starts with the energy, right? So that means Q, should it have a cosine or a sine? function if it's the capacitor starts with all the energy. Uh, cosine? It's going to be a cosine because cosine is equal to one when T is equal to zero. So the, I guess that's the other way to say it is whichever thing starts with the energy gets the cosine function. If the capacitor starts with the energy, it gets the cosine. Well, what's left in this case that would be I sine of omega t. Okay, and maybe I'll call this I max. All right. All right, so in this case, and we already saw how this is related to that. We already know how to find omega naught. That was part, so we know the frequency and the angular frequency, we know the current amplitude, so we have everything we need to figure this out. And now notice it says, clarify the initial direction of current in the inductor. What direction do you think current flows initially in the inductor here? Like at a half second after, or a nanosecond after you start it. It's a confusing question, so let me Off add some. Ways. Yeah, that's what I was I'm trying to figure out clockwise or counterclockwise. So do you agree current should flow this way 
initially. And so depending on like, if you want to call this the positive direction, you'd say, okay, make it a positive sine I omega T. If you wanted to talk about current flowing counterclockwise as the positive direction, you'd stick a minus sign on that equation. So depending on what you want to say, you could use either plus or minus based on that description. Okay, good. All right, and then magnetic energy as a function of time. This one is U equals one half I L squared or L I squared, sorry. We know I is a function of time. That means we know the energy. Same thing, we could get the energy in the charge. We know U of the charge is Q squared over 2C. We could find charge as a function of time and plug it in. And so we could do that. All right, um, I think I might've missed one, this one. At what time does current first reach 90% of its maximum? I'm gonna go to the solution to show you that one. Oh, that's chapter 30. That's not what I want. All right. And so here's all the numbers for you. So if I said, uh, let's find this out when the current is first 90% of I max. So what do I do? I said 90% of I max here. And notice you get a sine inverse, but there's also this omega naught, which has units of seconds, which gives us the right units. So there we go. Oh, this is important. Hey, 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 hey. I know you're tired. I know you don't want to listen right now. This is really important. You've got to pay attention to degrees and radians mode on every single problem for chapters 31 uh, and uh, uh, yeah, basically chapter 31, maybe a couple in 33. But oh my gosh, look at this. The units on omega are radians per second, right? If you take sine inverse in degrees, you get a bullshit answer. That is bad. So for the units to work out, you have to have your calculator in radians mode for taking sine inverse. Man, I'm glad we didn't skip this. Any questions about that? Magnetic energy, piece of cake. Electrical energy, piece of cake. Notice the total energy, this is what's crazy. It ends up being a constant. I'll show you here. Oh, okay, there's the, there's the um, part I talks about this full analogy that I've been talking about. Charge is position, velocity is current, et cetera. More on that. But here's what the oscillations look like. So this is the current and charge oscillations. Notice over here on the right side, we have current. And then on the left side, you have charge. So I have two different axes going there. So you could see that the, they're not the same axes, but yeah. So for the dashed line for current, whoops, that's the wrong color. For charge, read this axis. For current, read this axis. Okay. And let's go down to the energy oscillations. This is kind of cool. Notice the energy oscillations occur twice as rapidly. And the energy, if you have a cosine squared function, maybe you know this trig identity, notice you get a doubling of the frequency. So that actually makes sense. Those energy functions had cosine squared or sine squared in them. So there we go. And notice the total energy is a constant because you're adding sine squared plus cosine squared. Again, all this is to try and, no, not that, not that. All this is to try and explain this. Whoops. I'm gonna start here with this thing going. Let's reset this. So we'll get this thing rocking, right? Charge up that inductor. I should say energize the solenoid. Okay, now I'm gonna pop the lid on this. And so all we're trying to do is understand those curves that are happening there. And we're looking at these voltages as they oscillate and we should see the voltage just going back and forth 
uh, oh, not the voltage, excuse me, the energy going back and forth. So the resistor takes up negligible voltage because it's so small. And so these two, the inductor and the capacitor have to have the same, oh, this is, this is just kind of trippy, right? Yeah, I'll leave it at that. All right, so that's, that's LC oscillators. Um, I kind of walked you through that and I know I was kind of hurrying. The next problem shows you the opposite. I think it's really interesting to do this second problem. So let me show you here. I showed you the LC oscillator one. And then the idea here is all I did was I switched the inductor and the capacitor. So it starts out with the inductor having the initial energy and you could try and go through it and see what changes and what doesn't. Look at this. The voltage is the same. All of these numbers are the same. So what would you expect about the oscillations in terms of the energy? Would there be the same energy or less or more? What do you think? Oh, I'm killing you guys, sorry. The same? That's what you would think. That's what I thought too. I was shocked to discover it's a totally different problem, even though all the numbers are the same. Isn't that crazy? The idea is when you charge up the capacitor initially, it turns out the resistance doesn't matter when you charge up the capacitor initially. However, when you charge up or energize the inductor initially, the resistance does matter because that puts a limit on the current. And so the two problems are totally unrelated. So obviously there is some special value of resistance which would cause these two to have the same exact oscillation energy, but in general, they will not have the same uh, oscillation energy. They will have the same oscillation frequency. They have the same omega naught. All right. So I have no idea if this is making sense to any of you at all. How are we doing here? Is this, is this going okay? Or any questions about oscillations in general or? Okay, okay. Now I know some of you had physics 162. So you're like geniuses when it comes to oscillations. Maybe I'll say one last thing just to make sure we're clear here. Just I a have a quick question. Oh, go for it. Um, so with uh, omega naught, mm -hmm. uh, the oscillation frequency, mm -hmm. um, it's one over the square root of LC. Yes. So if C is like, let's say 3C, then it's three, you put a yes. three in front of it yep, and yep. all that. Okay. Yeah, Just yeah. Make sure. yeah. And so to be honest, these types of problems from this chapter a lot of times I tend to actually use numbers on test questions for these types of problems. So that will hopefully make that a little bit less painful because it'll just be some number you stick in. Is that good, Nick? Yep, thank you. Yep, okay. And so just to be clear here, uh, if we looked at say, um, let's just look at charge, right? And let's say it's in microcoulombs versus time in milliseconds. Right, and so you probably know you should always be looking for those prefixes, right? So um, if we have this thing, I just wanna be clear here. If we have this curve, whoops. Whoops. I know you should know this already from last week, but I just wanna make sure this is twice the amplitude. Sometimes that's called peak to peak. So we'll call that peak to peak. So this in this case would be charge peak to peak. This right here would be called peak charge. Okay. And now uh, another thing, you all looked up RMS. We'll get to that in the next section. But another thing here is notice the time to go from one complete cycle is the period. 
right? And then we know this relationship, omega. So to be clear, if you want to get the period, you can relate that to this plot and notice the period also relates to omega. And I know I've already said this, but I just want to make clear that we have all the terms down before we go to the next one where we're doing a lot of different things. Um, sometimes, like we saw in the last problem, this is called Q max. So a lot of times I just want to point out the amplitude has many names. The amplitude uh, is peak or it's amplitude or it's Q max. Now be careful here. I have tried very careful to be very careful in this chapter to write these words correctly, but there's a difference between current and current amplitude. Current amplitude or charge amplitude, let's, let's stick with charge, I've got charge here. So charge amplitude would be this. Charge would be this. It's the function. So be careful. If I say charge, strictly speaking, I mean the charge as a function of time because the charge varies. If I say charge amplitude or max charge or whatever, I mean the amplitude. Watch for that distinction in the next few problems, okay? All right. Oh my goodness. Let's see what the, okay. All right, um, let's see here, let's see. Um, so I'll let you do this one. Here's another way you could start this. By the way, LC oscillators are a key component in radios. Basically, if you wanna tune your cell phone to actually have it work, you have a certain inductance and capacitance in the circuit and then it's an antenna, right? So that's a loop antenna that you're viewing right there. So it turns out these oscillators are very useful. Um, and it turns out the math that you learn in them actually is very similar to the math that you learn in physics 162. Oh my gosh, somewhere up here is the next thing. All right, so we're coming up to this, oh boy. So uh, I'm just gonna point out page 199 and page 200, <laughs> that's what we're supposed to know for the rest of this chapter. Well, most of the rest of this chapter. So I want you to internalize everything on page 199 and 200 by the time we come back from a break at 6 p.m. <laughs> oh, shit. All right. So we'll come back for a break, and then we're going to hit this. Obviously, we're going to talk about it together not expect you to know it. So we're going to try and understand these next two pages, and it is intense. Okay? All right. Um, Go ahead and take a, a break. We'll start up again at six.
Yeah, it'd be nice to give everybody all A's. I would love it. It's a lot less work. Ah, uh, still got two minutes here. Any questions while we're on the break? All right, I'll let you do your thing. All right, let's get back into it here. So we've got 35 minutes. Let's try to make sense of an LRC series circuit, okay? Um, so let me, I know this seems a little crazy. I want you to understand this. Look at this thing, it looks insane. Our goal is to try and understand everything that you see going on in this crazy looking circus. Now, it's going to take some time to get there, but I promise you can understand this circuit. Now, one of the things that we have going for us is we're going to understand the RLC circuit in series, and then we don't have to do a lot of the math for any other circuit. Basically, we're going to try and work several different problems in a row, and we'll see what happens when you have no capacitor or no inductor. But I want to point out a huge difference from every single problem before now. Instead of a battery, we're using an AC source. Our power supply is now going to be the function generator. And notice this makes things very complicated. It's counterintuitive. I want to point out here, the RMS voltage of this is about six volts. Notice the RMS voltage across one of the circuit elements is nearly three times that. This one is nearly four times that. So one of the things that seems very counterintuitive in this is that the voltage you use as the source can be amplified by the LC oscillator portion of the circuit, which is very, very crazy. Now, 
that out there. Uh, can you say it again? Yeah, the LC oscillator portion of the circuit can amplify the source voltage. Very crazy. Um, so notice it's six volts down here, but much bigger up here. So we can actually get more voltage across the inductor than the source puts out. And this is not a typo. All right. Now the resistor voltage will always be less than or equal to the voltage across the source. So that's what will always be less than or equal to the source. Um, and in fact, the idea about this is, is kind of sneaky. One of the things we can do, so this slider right here, notice what I'm changing. Watch, I want you, whoops, come on now. I want you to watch in this area where I just drew an arrow, right down in here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this and notice what I'm doing is this is like the uh, voltage output of the function generator. I could turn the noise, I could turn the volume down or I could turn the volume up. Very similar to what we did last week. Now the frequency, that's changing the rate at which it wiggles. So I could go to a low frequency, right? And it doesn't wiggle very fast. I could go to a very high frequency and it's wiggling crazy fast. All right. So there's that information. So now notice what I do. So now rather than looking just where I had the pink arrows, you can watch these things up here. So I want you to watch these voltages up here. Let me clear this out and do it again. So I want, whoops. Ah. I want you to watch this stuff up here now. So the idea is I'm going to change the same sliders and I want you to watch that. So Obviously, if I just change the voltage down, notice all three of them scale with the source. So if I use a low source voltage, I get low output across the a resistor, capacitor, and inductor. If I use a large output, I get a large output. So that's kind of as you expect. However, watch what happens to the frequency. Now notice, I'm gonna to go to very low frequencies. At very low frequencies, Notice the capacitor is dominating the circuit. Do you see that? There's almost no current. How can I tell there's no current? I look at this resistor. I know at any time in any circuit, AC or not, the current is always equal to the voltage across that resistor, even if it's a function of time, divided by that resistor's value. So this is basically showing you the current. You could also say, well, wait a minute, isn't the voltage across an inductor related to the current as well? You bet it is. We see that it's basically small though. All right, does this make sense? I like to think about it this way. In the zero frequency limit, then you get back to a battery. A DC battery has a frequency of zero. Well, we would expect the capacitor to charge up and there'd be nothing left over for the resistor or the uh, inductor. Again, if I had zero frequency, it would be a battery and the capacitor would get charged up and there'd be nothing left for the inductor. All right, so let's go to the opposite extreme. I'm gonna go to very high frequencies. Which circuit element do you think is going to dominate? at extremely high frequencies, it's the inductor. Now think about this. The inductor does not like changes to the current. The source voltage is trying to change, right? Remember, this is trying to change the current rapidly. The inductor opposes those changes. And so the inductor dominates and it basically clamps down the circuit and we see the inductor dominates at high frequencies. So far, so good. Now, what if the porridge is just right? If I get to just the right frequency, right about there, 
Whoops, can I go one more? It's pretty hard to get it right on that peak. There we go, right in the peak. Okay, so in this case, take a look at this situation now. Right now, all of the voltage across the source is equal to the voltage across the resistor, which means these two voltages, which are the same in size, are exactly out of phase. Look at this, when the blue one, watch them peak. When one of them peaks, the other one is hitting a trough and vice versa. So when the capacitor is at its maximum, the inductor is at its minimum, and we see it cancels out. That's what this crazy looking picture over here is supposed to be showing. It's showing that these voltages can be thought of as arrows spinning around in circles. And the arrows, the tip of the arrowhead is tracing out the sine waves. And notice the blue arrow is tracing out a sine wave that's up and down, whereas the green one is tracing out a sine wave that's down and up. Or look at these polarities right here. Right? Just look at the polarity. Sorry, I kind of drew over it there. But if you look, watch this number. When this one's positive, the other one right here would be negative. And that's showing that they're peaking at opposite times. So what we see here is the following. We get maximum current amplitude at some special resonance frequency. That resonance frequency is the same as the LC oscillator. Isn't this crazy? So if you pick the source frequency to match the LC oscillator frequency, then you get big current. However, if you choose a frequency that is not matching, if it's too low, if the source frequency is lower than the oscillator resonance frequency, the capacitor dominates. It's a low frequency. Capacitors dominate at low frequency. If you use a high frequency, high compared to the LC oscillator resonant frequency, the inductor dominates. Okay, that's the basic concepts. I'm going to pause and see if you have questions. This is intense. Can you explain the graph with the, uh, the purple? Yes. This uh, Z has units of ohms. Z is called impedance. It's not resistance. So basically, this is like one over one over ohms. Well, that's analogous to current. So what we're trying to show here, if I could, actually this will show it a little bit better. What this purple plot is trying to show is the height of this curve is right there. At this frequency, so at this frequency, I get that height for the current. Now, if I go to a different frequency, let's say I go to right here, let's see what happens. Hold on. Right about there, maybe. I'm sorry if it's not perfect. But so now when I go to this frequency, I get this much current amplitude. And then if I go one more, if I go a little bit more right to there, now I would get, and so this is actually what you're going to do in the lab tomorrow. What I did is I recorded some waveforms on a screen and I swept the frequency. When I say sweep the frequency, that just means change the frequency. So I'm going to sweep the frequency and you record the amplitude of the current. However, how do we get current? What you're really gonna be doing is you're gonna get the voltage across the resistor, you get it peak to peak, and then you can divide by 
two to get the peak current. Then you could divide by root two to get RMS current because we know VRMS across the resistor would be V peak to peak across the resistor divided by two root two from some stupid website you read last week, okay? And that is essentially this number divided by R gives you current RMS. And that's what that plot is showing. It's basically showing the amount of current amplitude divided by root two for each different frequency. So at different frequencies, you get more or less current amplitude, which means you get more or less I RMS. Nick, did that address your question? Oh, did I not? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't give you guys the link. I'm sorry. Thanks, Tom, my bad. Uh, Nick, you're muted. Oh, what? oh, I hit the button. That's weird. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. You, okay, got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, between the I divided by R and the thing before, is, is that a multiplication there? Where's that? Between the I divided by R. Oh, yeah, right there. Th yeah, that's a multiplication? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, yeah, that's cool. So let me go to something a little bit less intense. And then when we come back to this, you'll be like, oh yeah, I got all that. So here is what we're going to try to do. Now, there's a couple of watch outs here. We better watch out. I, use, I followed a physics textbook and for some reason, most physics textbooks use omega T plus a phase angle for the LC oscillator and they use omega T minus V, but not every book. I'm warning you right now, if you use another book or something, you better watch carefully. Do they use a plus or a minus sign here? Some people actually put the phase angle in here and make it positive. That's about half the textbooks. The others put it here and make it negative, but almost all of them use omega T plus, ah, whatever. Watch your minus signs when you're reading. Let's, that's a detail that's going to, you're going to be snowed by that at some point, but just use my notes for my tests and you'll be all right. Okay. So, oh, let me get that crap off of there. There we go. Okay. So now I'm going to start with three simple circuits. Let's say we have an L and R and a C, and we're just looking at them separately, okay? What happens here is um, this one, I think you probably understand. Let's start with that. If you just have a resistor in the circuit, nothing weird happens, right? The resistor does not oppose changes in flux. It does not store energy in electric field. So what happens here is if you apply a voltage source like this, the current right here is going to be in phase with it. Now you're gonna hear me say this a lot. In phase just means peaking at the same time. It peaks at the same time. It troughs at the same time. That means in phase. Okay. Next, let's go up to this inductive one up here. Purely inductive circuit. Now think about this. It's going to oppose changes. So if current is flowing, it's not going to want to shut off right away. Okay. And so, um, or if current is not flowing, it's not going to want to start up right away. So when you apply max voltage, we don't expect the current to be flowing. It's going to be a little bit behind there. So we say that the source voltage leads the current. You could also say current lags voltage. So this is going to be a source of frustration for you. The words lead and lag are both used all the time. And so basically we say if something is peaking just before another waveform, we say it's leading. If something is peaking just after, we say it's lagging. So someone might say, oh, here the source voltage from the function generator is leading the current by 90 degrees or a quarter of a period, right? Remember, there's 360 degrees in a full cycle. 
So that means 90 degrees is like a quarter cycle. And so that's like period over four. Okay. All right, so just be aware. We see, it turns out this is true. The inductor is, uh, if it helps, the voltage across the inductor is L times, uh, I think it's minus L di dt. I don't remember how, it depends on whether you wanna talk about the magnitude of the voltage or not or the polarity. But the fact remains is, when you take the derivative of a sine or a cosine function, you get the next one, which shifts at 90 degrees, right? So if you take a derivative of sine, you get cosine. Well, cosine is 90 degrees out of phase, all right? Similarly down here, Q is equal to VC. So down here, if I take the derivative of each side, I is the derivative of that. So I get C times dV dt. And notice here, we get that same 90 degrees issue. Now, here's where it's a little bit different. The capacitor can store some energy, and so it actually leads. Now, be careful. Watch. It says lags, but you got to be careful. The, sor uh, the source voltage lags the current, or the current is leading the source voltage. Those are both equivalent ways. So the math here, basically, because you get a derivative, when you take these derivatives, you get a 90-degree phase shift, a 90 degree change in who's leading or lagging. I'm going to pause and see if there's any like, questions. Yeah, real quick. Yeah. Um, I, I thought you said that on the last one that mm -hmm. V uh, uh, leads as well. I think. I think oh, you said I'm sorry. It. Okay. Yeah. So let's make sure. So here I would say the source voltage lags the current, or I would say the current leads the source voltage. Either one of those would be acceptable. If I misspoke before, I'm sorry. Is that good? Yeah, yep. great. Well, Tom, Eli the Iceman is a convenient mnemonic device which will help us. And so uh, let's get to that. So this is very difficult to remember. So what we say right down here is what Tom was just talking about. So you could say Eli the Ice Woman, you could say Eli the ice organism. You could say Eli the ice Jorstad. You could do whatever you want with Eli at ice. I don't care, but look at how cool this is. Um, so the idea here is Eli has source voltage and current in it. And notice for an inductor, E comes before I. That means voltage comes before current or voltage leads current in the word Eli. Voltage leads current for an inductor. Next, ice, I comes before E. So it's exactly the opposite. Current leads voltage, or you could say voltage lags current for a capacitive circuit. Voltage lags current for capacitive. Eli the ice organism. Check it. So far, so good. That's how you can remember this one. And this is that annoying thing I was telling you about. Um, we have to be very careful with leading and lagging because both terms are used. But just remember this and forget everything else. Eli the ice organism. Okay. Now, phase angles. I want to let me go back up to our master equation here. It turns out this is the source voltage. And usually the other thing we care about in this type of circuit is what is the current? Now, look carefully here. This is source voltage. This is source voltage amplitude. This is current. This is current amplitude. And notice there's a phase angle introduced. It turns out the source voltage and the current are not always in phase. Let me prove that to you. Uh, where was that one? Was it this one? This one. So right now, I wish there was a pause button on this one. 
I don't know how to do that. But the idea here is, I just want to point out, just look carefully. Come on, zoom, zoom. Watch this right here versus this right here. Are they peaking at exactly the same time? No. Right now, who is leading? Remember, down here, this is the source. Our source of energy is the function generator. And this is the current which relates to this resistor right over here. So in this case, who is leading, who is lagging, whatever. Somebody try it. It's okay to fail. Oh, I see some chat. Let's see who said it in the chat. Okay, so the source voltage is leading. So let's think about this. Think about this, Eli. Right now, the inductor is dominant. How can I tell? I'm at a high frequency compared to the resonance frequency. Okay, so that means the source voltage, E, is leading the current. That makes sense. Good job. Let's try another one. If I come right here, if I try to get this right on resonance, now there is no, uh, and nice, Claudia, you got it too. Nice job. So in this case, sorry, I'm a little slow at the chat. Sometimes I only see the last one in there, my bad. So um, in this case, these two waves are canceling out. And I just want to point out, look, it's peaking right at the same time. Watch it now. So this would be effectively a purely resistive circuit. It turns out when you are right at resonance, these two act like a short. What? Again, if you are right at resonance, these, the capacitor and the inductor act like a short crazy and then all the voltages across the resistor and everything's in phase so there's no eli there's no ice now let's go to a low frequency which circuit element dominates at low frequencies remind me at low frequencies which circuit element will dominate capacitor capacitor so now if capacitor is dominating should i use eli or should i use ice Ice. 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 And so hopefully what we see is the current is leading voltage or the voltage is lagging. Look at the current. It's peaking right now. Now this one peaked. So clearly it's working. So we see that current is leading source voltage if we're at a capacitively dominated circuit. All right. Let's go back to here. Isn't this fun? I hope you're having fun. I love this crap. It's just so interesting. Okay, so um, by the way, um, if you have a purely inductive circuit, you can use a phase angle of 90 degrees or pi over two radians. Now here is going to be an, uh, an interesting and annoying thing for you. Omega is always given in radians per second. Oftentimes it's given in crads, kiloradians per second. So let's just do that. It's often kiloradians per second. Phase angles, by convention, are always given in degrees. However, if you're going to punch it in, <laughs> you better pick one mode. And so the mode that you punch in is usually radians. So I'm not lying to you. This is just what electrical engineers do to ensure job security. They always list this in radians. They always list this in degrees, but then they remember to quickly convert it. Now, I'll be honest with you. I like it in degrees, and you will get used to it for reasons I can't go into right now. It turns out um, there's tricks where you don't usually need to plug into this equation, and so that's why they usually keep it in degrees. Everybody knows 90 degrees is a quarter wave. So if you're talking about whether a signal is in phase or out of phase, it makes sense to talk to others in degrees because they understand that intuitively. They know that 180 degrees is completely opposite. They know that zero degrees is in phase and they know that 90 degrees is out of phase by a quarter period. Or So that's why people use these, but you're needing to plug in numbers in radians because there's another number in radians. Whoa, that's intense. 
Couldn't we also just convert uh, the omega there into degrees? You could. Yeah, you yeah. can convert the omega into degrees. Um, yeah, excellent point. So just use whatever, but make just watch your degrees and radians like a hawk in this chapter. I would hate for you to lose points for something like that. You know what's going to happen if you don't do the homework, all right? So here's all the rest of that chart. Let's make sure we have these terms down, okay? Source max or V0, that's the amplitude of the source voltage. Now, it turns out the source amplitude divided by Z, which is impedance, which has units of ohms, something we'll get into. Basically, V, instead of ohms law being V equals IR, now we're saying V equals IZ, okay? And to be clear, V here is not voltage as a function of time, it's voltage amplitude, and this is current amplitude. Now you could do it with voltage or current as well. Z is the impedance. If you've ever looked on a speaker, maybe you've seen the speakers say eight ohms. That's not its resistance. The resistance of a common speaker might be say like five ohms or, or two ohms, maybe 2.5 ohms. And the idea is the windings in the coils have a certain amount of resistance, but the inductance of that coil is massive. And so the inductance actually makes up the other, you know, five and a half ohms of impedance. And so, um, yeah, this is just an equation we're going to use, okay? A phase angle. If you recall, the current has a phase angle in it. This shows you how to get that phase angle. Now I keep showing this XL and XC. What are those things? Capacitive reactance. This has units of ohms. It's not resistance. You do not say the resistance of a capacitor. That is not, well, actually capacitors do have, uh, let me stay out of it. That's a side note. That's something totally different. That's a manufacturing defect. But there's reactance that has units of ohms and inductant reactance. So basically this is a measure of how much the capacitor impedes current flow. So it's like resistance, but we call it impedance. It's a measure of how much the capacitor impedes current flow. And notice frequency is on the bottom. If you have a very, very high frequency, the capacitor doesn't have time to charge up. The capacitor does not impede current flow. Again, if you have a very high frequency, the capacitor does not have time to charge up. Its impedance or ability to impede, its reactance is low. On the other hand, if you use a battery, the frequency is basically zero and the capacitor has infinite reactance and it totally stops current flow. We know this from experience. Okay. Quick question. Go, go ahead. Um, is there a difference between the omega knot that we had earlier and the omegas that we're seeing here? Absolutely. And I'll get to that in just a second. So, okay. um, and, and actually it's right here. Watch out. Okay. So give me just a second. So inductive reactance is uh, the same idea, except I want to point out that notice if you go to very high frequencies, the inductor dominates and this term blows up. If you're at very low frequencies, things are not changing that much. Inductors oppose changes to the magnetic field. If you're not changing the current, you're not changing the magnetic field. If you're not changing it rapidly, oh crap, shouldn't that be an X sub L? Damn it. Write that in, sorry. Sorry, my bad. Uh, they don't have the same subscript. Sorry, inductive reactance. I'm gonna fix that before I forget. Give me just a second here. That's dumb. 200. Okay. Now, Nick just pointed out the big problem that students have. Watch out! F is source frequency. The resonance frequency is dictated by the choice of inductor and capacitor you use in the circuit. If I could go back to my simulation, maybe I have it. The idea is this special frequency right here is omega naught. That is equal to one over the square root of LC. 
Now, the frequency that I actually turn this dial to is F. So notice that I could choose a frequency that's above omega naught. I could choose it below omega naught. And notice right now I'm using omega and F interchangeably. I'm a terrible person. So let me be more clear here. This is going in linear frequency right now, right? So I didn't realize right now they're using linear frequency in Hertz. So this should actually be F naught right there. And to be clear, F naught is omega naught divided by two pi. which is equal to one over two pi root LC. Nick, does that address your question? Yes, sir. So watch out, that is tricky. And I guarantee you're gonna screw it up too. Um, so, and hopefully you screw it up in the homework and then you won't screw it up on test day because like, oh God, I wasted two hours on this stupid problem. All right, let's go back to here. Um, all right, and so it's almost time to go, but notice, um, I just wanna point out peak voltage, not voltage, peak voltage is this. So this shows you how to finish out the rest of these. This helps you write the voltage across the inductor as a function of time. This helps you write the voltage across the capacitor. Notice these minus pi over twos, that comes from this leading lag crap and the leading lag crap. There's a positive pi over two on this one. Now you could again write 90 degrees if you want. Um, so we see that we're gonna be going between radians and I chose to, yeah, whatever. Um, but notice this amplitude out in front. How do you get that? That's this equation. All this stuff, by the way, maybe all of it. It's kind of, whoops. kind of like right in here. Hopefully you can see that. So I this stuff comes in so handy, I put it right there. Or if you want, you could bookmark this page and be ready for LRC madness. You're gonna use this all day tomorrow in lab. Now I know it's time to go, but I'll, uh, I'll leave you with one question to look at here. And I, I, sorry, it's just, I gotta show you something with this. This is probably a fairly accessible problem to do. Now, um, I'm not going to lie to you. Your next quiz has got a lot of plots on it. Okay. Your next quiz has a lot of plots on it. So um, you need to understand graphs. You usually understand graphs better if you make them. We're going to make some in class tomorrow and I'll help you with that. But if you want to try and do these ones, you could try this one. And if you think you're a badass, this one usually skunks people when they first see it. So you could try those two questions before tomorrow and that'll, that'll get you there. Um, but I, I really think this problem at, at bare minimum, try to at least read through it and follow it so you're not lost. Oh my gosh, total typo there, capacitance. <laughs>